The book of Matthew 5:45 and 48 That you may be sons of your Father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection only those that will be clothed into perfection like the perfection that the Heavenly Father has will receive in the time that God decides an incorrupt body that will be the guarantee of their rapture and then will be raptured and meet the Lord in heaven. And so to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect is to bless the vessels of mercy and curse the vessels of wrath. To curse means not have not have anger inside, but curse meaning action, not to communicate with them. That's it. Sometimes people think you need to have inside some kind of anger, hatred against them. To love God means not have some kind of emotions or feelings, but fulfilling His commandments. The same thing here. To hate lawless and wicked people that resist the truth, that call themselves Christians, but resist the truth, they pervert the truth. This means to stay away from them and not communicate with them. And so this practically is the great commandment it is the inheritance of all saints of all times, and the commandment is addressed by Christ strictly to his students. Therefore, people who do not acknowledge over themselves the authority of a person that is sent by God have never had any part to the inheritance that is contained in this commandment, and it is doubtful that they will ever be able to. As it relates to fulfilling this commanding order to be vigilant over the Word of God within our heart, as God is vigilant over His spoken word within the temple of our body, we stop to study the following question. What specific goals does the righteousness of God pursue that we are collaborating with within our heart? Because it is within our heart. And in part, we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart received by us in the two broken tablets of the covenant, where we, in the death of the Lord Jesus, die by the law for the law, so that in the new tablets of the covenant symbolizing the resurrection of Christ, we can receive justification so that we can live for the one that died for us and resurrected. As it is written, He died for our sins and He rose for our justification. We can receive justification in the teaching of resurrection, not in the teaching of death. And so, in this way, we can obtain confirmation of our salvation in new tablets of the covenant symbolizing the resurrection of Christ so that we can provide God with the proper grounds to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith, similar to how he gave this to this promise to Abraham and his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13 Therefore, the covenant of peace in the heart of a warrior in prayer is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God that is spoken by his delegated ones. God's faith is information that comes from the preached to us word. Faith is from hearing. It's not an emotion. It is information. Our faith is obedience to this information. And so, God's Faith is the general, and our faith is the soldier that says, Yes, Lord, I will do as you want, that waits. What will the Lord say so that I can fulfill it? Therefore, by what signs do we examine ourselves that the peace of God rules within our heart, which identifies us as the sons of God and as the most holy? We know that to examine our heart as to whether the peace of God is governing in it is 
By the ability to be a peacemaker, this characterizes us as the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, Matthew 5, 9. And so a person can perform peace when he has this peace in his heart. If he, this peace can, is, is somehow changed in any way or is able to be changed in different ways, that means we haven't grown to that uh, measure to, to grow this peace. God gives us this peace. We make this covenant of peace with him, blood, salt, and peace. But we make it in the this covenant in the form of a seed. Uh, we are given this covenant that God makes with us in the format of a guarantee, a seed. And the seed doesn't mean that you you have any fruit from it yet. As you would put a down payment for a home, that doesn't mean that this home already belongs to you. That means you will own it once you uh, find the entire amount due that you still owe. And once you cover, pay that entire amount that you owe for this house, then will it be your own? You will be owner. And it is the same thing here. The covenant of peace will be in our heart. And in the covenant of peace are all of the promises of God. And it will become our own when we grow in our heart from the seed uh, fruit. The fruit in this covenant. When in our heart there will be peace that nothing will be able to shake. The Lord says, I give you peace, not the peace that the world gives. And so any uh, trials in our life, any losses, gains, nothing will be able to uh, move or change this peace. And it will be the opposite. The more you lose in this life, uh, the greater and the stronger that peace will show itself, demonstrate itself in your heart. It will be clearer and more bright as we say, the darker the night, the brighter the stars. And so these promises in the form of stars, the night is dark and it's darker. And right now it's uh, not like ever before uh, uh, against the church of God to devour her. We see uh, the church as it is today, many sins legalized, nothing is holy anymore. It's just dead organizations or dancing and doing whatever they do, Christianity. And we understand that the time is coming to an end. Is there no one on earth left that has God's faith? Is there faith? There are those that have it. He says, don't be afraid, little flock. That means there, there are, we just don't know about them. There is a small flock. Even amongst those people that I listed, you have a couple of people that did not defile themselves and they will walk with me. And so the six signs by which we need to judge of our belonging to the sons of peace have already been subjects of our study and we stop to study the seventh. This is the seventh sign by which we need to judge that we belong to the sons of peace. And this is our ability to clothe ourself, our essence, into the holy or the selective love of God. The holy love of God is always selective. God has no tolerance. He loves those who love Him and hates those who hate Him. And so He shines His sun upon the righteous in favor and the unrighteous, he burns with the sun, he pours out his rains, and they go, and they are poured out. This is a blessing for one and as a punishment for the other, and we are witnesses. This is happening in the world. Africa is burned with the sun because there's nowhere else like Africa is there uh, witchcraft. Almost m most of the people there are in some sort of witchcraft. Look at the rains, what, what's going on right now with flooding, where there was no rain before. Now there's pouring rains where there's no snow. Normally there's no snow. There's Everything's changing and shaking. The, and so those who are trying to diagnose all of this, figure out why this is all happening on the earth. Look at the book of Isaiah and you will know why. The earth is shaking as drunk because it's lawlessness are heavy upon it. The earth is prepared to be destroyed. But for you who 
are fearing before the Lord, the sun of righteousness will rise and healing in its rays, and you will go out and dance as a young bull. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful, Colossians 3, 14, 15, and be thankful, that's be in friendship, be thankful, with, that means If you don't have this, you don't have God's love. It's incredible, but this is so. Do not uh, say that love is just a good smile. Uh, Love has to come from a sincere, clean heart. The desire to serve your neighbor and not use this neighbor for your own personal needs. In Scripture, the holy or selective love of God, agape, is presented in Scripture by the Holy Spirit in the light of seven unchanging virtues or components by the preached word of the apostles and prophets that in essence are the unchanging virtues of the qualities of God. That what we are studying, what we're studying, we're learning these seven qualities, virtues, These, this is the heart of the Heavenly Father. And when we say be perfect, it says be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This is what it means, that our heart be like the heart of the Heavenly Father, that it have these qualities, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Written in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 8. In a specific format of the seven given characteristics of virtue that united identify the goodness of God within our heart, we have already studied five characteristics and have been studying the sixth. This is the calling to demonstrate the power of brotherly love in our faith, or to demonstrate in brotherly love in our relationship with one another, God's love agape. Having this great and noble component in demonstrating brotherly love in our faith moves us from the state of eternal death into the state of eternal life. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3, 14, 15. And so, of course, when we pass from the state of death into the state of eternal life, when we're born from the seed of the word of truth, at this time, we as children, we love all saints. You know, when I was a child, I did not have anything uh, against any person. I accepted the entire church of God, all and everyone was as angels of God to me, literally. I was very, uh, I was very uh, considerate toward each person and they, I remember I was about six years old at the time and when they would bring me to this place with the peop- with the church, I literally had shivers down my, on my skin, being with them, and I sensed God's presence at the time. And all were in my eyes as angels of God. And only after I began growing, and I was about in my middle middle years, uh, teenage years, I I saw in the eyes of one brother a very confusing to me look, uh, an image. It wasn't an angelic, uh, something angelic in his eyes. It was something demonic, jealousy. And I became afraid. And I said, it can't be. Maybe I just imagined this. It can't be. Until this time, no one was jealous of me. But when I... I became a a, a teenager, I I realized there was jealousy until this time the church accepted me as a child. When I was 12, uh, they would ask me to say the word. They said, brother, read whatever you want from the Bible. And so I would just read what was in the Bible. And I spoke about the things that I saw in the Bible, what God gave to me. To understand, and I thought this was normal and that everyone had this. But for everyone else, it was a revelation, and they cried. And so when I began to grow and I became a teenager, 
Then suddenly, in these angels, I started to see a jealousy. This was what lived in them because it doesn't wake up if it's, if it's not there. A glass of clean water, you can stir it as much as you want. The water remains clean. But if it's clean, but at the bottom, there's something, a sediment of some kind. As soon as you start to... Uh, you start to move the water around, it starts to come up and rise, and you'll see this, this sediment that's, from the, that's on the bottom. And so when we're grown, then we are offered life and death. What does it mean to pass from death to life? This is a decision, a decision to choose death or life. Recently, a brother called me and said, I want you to help me uh, handle and uh, make peace with my children and he said I left I left this church uh, normally and I said there's not really a normal way to leave in the church you are offered a choice a life or death you chose death and now you want to have uh, a relationship with your children you supported the great lawlessness <clears throat> you wounded wounded the church, you wounded God, you spoke evil against us, and now you want a relationship with your children and that I help you with this? People don't understand these things. Relevant to this, as with the previous components of the virtue of God, in His unique for us goodness, which we are called to demonstrate in our faith in the seven forms of virtue, and in this case brotherly love, we came to the necessity to study four classical questions. What do the scriptures say about the power of brotherly love, which we are called to demonstrate in our faith? What purpose is the power of brotherly love called to fulfill <clears throat> in our relationship with God and with each other? What conditions do we need to fulfill so that we can receive the power to demonstrate brotherly love in our faith in a specific format, we already looked at these three questions and stopped to study question four. By what science can we examine ourselves as to whether we are demonstrating brotherly love in our faith? The first five signs by which we need to judge that we are demonstrating brotherly love or the power of brotherly love in our faith has already been the subject of our study and so therefore we will immediately move to the sixth sign. We already began this sign uh, and we continue to study. This is our ability to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. You, let your gentleness be known to all men. Nothing is a light to the in a person as much as gentleness is a light. If there's no gentle gentleness, there's no light. We no longer then are a light, but we are just there's smoke instead of light. And people are not able to see God. And so let your gentleness be known to all men why the Lord is at hand. We together need to grow in ourselves this gentleness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that we are talking about, about which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 5 through 7. Although there are a lot, you may experience a lot of different uh, hurricanes or any other things within yourself, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, if it's there, of course, it will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. We know that to be put into Jesus Christ, you need to find the good wife that has the virtue of a narrow gate. You need to find such a church of Christ where you would have the wholesome evangelical teaching. That is the elementary teaching of Jesus Christ, where the truth is not damaged. Apostle Paul says, we preach to you not as many, 
we don't peddle with the word, we don't damage it. At the time of Apostle Paul, many preachers were offering uh, to the people damaged words, peddled words. If you present it undamaged, then you bring about your upon yourself uh, persecution, first from the religious elite of the Jews and then also Rome when you preach the... And so Rome acknowledged Christ, but as one of their gods and in the pantheon of gods they also had an altar to an unknown god but god will not uh, be okay with you putting him into the temple of uh, dathan and and so people will then say where's the tolerance this tolerance today has has become so intense that the multitudes are ready uh, to a point that the people are ready that uh, fire be pour upon, poured upon them as uh, at Sodom and Gomorrah. And even churches say we're not against uh, gays, lesbians, and transgenders. They say they're not against. To one of these pastors, I said, do you want your daughter your daughters be lesbians. He had two daughters. No, he says. Then I, I ask him, why do you say you accept that? Why We accept when these gays and lesbians, when they repent, then we do accept that. But if I, and if I say this, that means I'm not tolerant and I bring about hate from others because of it. In the given place of scripture, the character of the fruit of the Spirit revealing itself in the quality of gentleness by the means of which we are able to discipline our tongue by the truth that is concealed within our heart because sometimes truth is concealed in the heart but it is not yet grown into the fruits of the tree of life and as it is not yet grown into the fruits of the tree of life we can't discipline our mouth with that truth but as when it is grown into the tree uh, fruits of the tree of life we can discipline our tongue and this gentleness it is contrary to the character of works of the flesh that reveals itself in disobedience to the truth or unfaithfulness. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, pretty much I warn you in, in advance, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When a person crucifies his flesh with its passions and desires, then you can grow this fruit, that these qualities that are one in each other and actually come one from the other. They support that truthfulness of the other and they identify that truthfulness. If you have gentleness and I together with you, then we have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And if you take any, they are all in one the other. Galatians 5, 19 through 24. The ability of a gentle person to not be anxious about anything when it comes to his financial well-being on earth is contrary to the preoccupations or concerns of a man whose mouth is not disciplined with the reins of gentleness. As it is written, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15.4 And so the tree of life that bears fruit 12 times a year, that we grow in our heart, it is in this uh, formula uh, as a wholesome tongue, a tree of life, again, that is grown in our heart, will be identified within a wholesome tongue. A wholesome tongue is one that's disciplined by the Word of God. Just as God disciplines Himself with His own Word and behaves within the boundaries of His words, as soon as the Heavenly Father says something, He immediately becomes the servant of that Word, a voluntary servant. He values His Word so much because it shows how He is actually. 
And so for God, it is very precious. His word is precious and he has magnified his word above all of his names. He has placed it above all of his names as a crown, as it is, says right here in the front, in the beginning was the word. This is God's throne. Upon the throne sits the word of God the personified word uh, that is Jesus Christ he magnified him and so the father shows uh, he's an ex- he's the example he's example for the son and the Holy Spirit how you need to discipline your own mouth you that you can only speak or they need to speak only what the Heavenly Father speaks the Heavenly Father is a servant of his own words he is vigilant so that it be fulfilled and he's vigilant where within the temple of our body the Son of God is vigilant over the word so that the word that the Father has spoken that it be fulfilled the Holy Spirit is a servant of the word that God has spoken with his mouth and so these three individual they are servants of the word of God that comes out of God's mouth and we are also called to be servants of that word but it's not possible uh, just at the tip of a wand you need to receive it in the form of a seed and the, the, into the good soil of your heart that your heart needs to be cleansed from dead works and to clean it from dead works is to die for your nation the house of your father and for your destructive way of life and only after that can you put the undamaged word there if your heart is not cleansed from dead works then you will resist that truth and you will place the damaged word into your heart because the undamaged will appear to you as if heretic a person that is carnal or of the flesh cannot receive the things of the spirit they consider it foolishness but the spiritual one uh, decides things preoccupations or concerns that lead to the breaking of our spirit are genetic bonds of fear that have been passed on to us by the sinful seed of our fathers in the flesh that we are bound with for the reason that we have not grown the fruit of gentleness in the soil of our good heart with which we would have been able to discipline our mouth and this discipline will determine whether we demonstrate then the power of brotherly love in our faith Therefore, preoccupation or concern is a testimony of the absence of the fruit of gentleness in the spirit of a man, which indicates the fact that the soil of the heart is not good, that he is refusing to clean from dead works. Dead works are works that come from the flesh. This is practicing of spiritual gifts, this is evangelism, prayers, singing, sermons, If it's coming from the flesh, the spring, the wellspring is the flesh, then these are dead works. And the most striking is that this concern or preoccupation is considered by men of the flesh to be a form of spiritual expression or demonstration. This can be clearly seen when you compare the definition of these two words that are contrary one to another, contrary in character and origin. Concern that shows itself in preoccupation means it's disobedience, unbelief. We're talking about disobedience to the Word of God, unbelief, disobeying the faith of God, an undisciplined tongue by the bonds of gentleness, something occult, a hard heart, a net of the evil one, the path of of death. This is the preoccupation of man. And now the contrary to it, gentleness that shows itself in a disciplined tongue, disciplined by the word of God. This is the tree of life, the obedience of our faith to God's faith, wisdom, strength, hardness, power, trust upon God, mercy, compassion, mercy toward vessels of mercy, compassion for vessels of mercy, the net of the kingdom of heaven where we catch ourselves when we confess God's faith that is in our heart because we catch ourselves with our own words that we confess if we confess the truth that it's damaged 
then we catch ourselves into the nets of the evil one. But if we confess the undamaged truth, we catch ourselves into nets of the kingdom of heaven. And so concern, preoccupation in this case, in demonstrating disobedience to the order contained in the body of Christ, members a person to the category of lawless men that resist the truth of the preached word and try to clothe the works of the flesh into garments of an outward appearance of godliness. At the same time, the gentleness of the heart that makes itself known in a gentle uh, mouth or tongue is an identification of the fruit of the Spirit, testifying of the presence of the grown tree of life within the spirit of a person. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 15.4 The presence of the fruit of gentleness in a man is testimony that this person is clothed into the virtue of a student of Christ, which gives him the ability to resist the words that come from his personal flesh. This is so that he can open up his mouth for confession of the faith of God that abides in his heart. Come to me, all you who are who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This is... These are the direct words of Christ. At the same time, the presence of preoccupation within the soul of man is testimony revealing the work of the flesh in man. It is from such people that you should turn away so that we do not waste what we have been working on so that we can inherit the kingdom of heaven in the fruit of tree of life that is grown by us in the Eden of our heart. But note this, that in the last days, <clears throat> perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. We're talking about men that are in the church. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. If it's a, a tolerant love, if you could say that there's a tolerant love, that means we need to love these kind. We need to show God's Christ, uh, uh, God's or Christ's love for them. But you can't because they've already clothed themselves into darkness. You can sh- show the light of God to the world because they don't know who God is or holiness. But these people are in the, are in the church. They knew they were holy, but then legalized for themselves Uh, sin, they brought sin in and said it's not sin, you can do everything in small amounts in measure. They say even to spiritual people, you can even uh, commit fornication once in a while. One charismatic leader was speaking, a charismatic pastor, he says they can have lovers. Adam had wives, or Abraham had wives, so why can't I uh, uh, have a couple of lovers of my own? Uh, they're my secretaries. They're not my wives. To to literally get to such a f- foolish uh, foolishness, uh, and this is the kind of person uh, that is respected, where people shake his hand and they don't wa- and they don't wash their hand for days because they shook his hand. I just want to say one thing, that any false charismatic service that is like this one, they say, yes, I don't do this, but your format service is like this. Your uh, teacher is like a monkey running around the uh, stage saying for you, telling you to shout all kinds of different random things. You know how Jesus taught? He sat down and he taught. You know, teaching cannot be passed on uh, standing. I always stood uh, when I was at, here at the at the altar, and the Holy Spirit always uh, would one uh, spoke in me that I should sit. God sits upon His throne, and from there He speaks. And so you need to sit down, and the Word of God 
needs to be uh, taught so that what did your pastor have a problem that he now sits down no he's been healed that's why he sat down right now we just read from such people turn away this is a portrait characteristic of preoccupied people in the church that refuse to uh, the characteristic of preoccupi preoccupied men who refuse to acknowledge that they are bound with chains of the of corrupt desires which they clothe into garments of pseudo godliness so that they not lose their significance and their self ego we need to pay attention to the fact that during specific circumstances even a fool <clears throat> when he is silent can appear to be wise and one that shuts his lips is considered sometimes perceptive as if he's disciplined but he's silent not because of he's disciplined but because he doesn't know what to say he who has knowledge spares his words and a man of understanding is out is of a calm spirit even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace when he shuts his lips he is considered perceptive proverbs 17 27 28 and to determine the presence of gentleness within yourself, which demonstrates itself in trust upon God and upon His Word, in waiting for the occurrence of salvation for our body, <clears throat> it is necessary in brotherly love to pay attention to one phrase of the being studied by us text, by which we need to differentiate gentleness from undiscipline and wisdom from stupidity. This is by our ability to make our desires known to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that is, <clears throat> that is, in essence, the desire of God and God's will. Not our desire or our will, but God's will that then becomes ours as we sing, so that your will become my own. You can sing this, but we often force God to fulfill our, our will Lord, I really want this, or Lord, you, you wrote this in your Bible, but God will not fulfill what's written here in the Bible. He will fulfill what's written in your heart. What's written in your heart. And so to know in what way you can determine gentleness and separate it from undiscipline in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God a more accurate version will sound like this in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving open up your desire to fulfill the will of God which contains our purpose and our calling in God's will is our calling and our will. We need to pray that God fulfill His will and we fulfill our calling. We need to cast off of ourself our old man, literally remove him from ourself, tear him off of ourselves, renew our mind by the spirit of our mind, and afterwards, with our renewed mind, begin the process of clothing ourselves into our new person. That's our calling to proclaim the faith of God that's in our heart, this undamaged truth, and with these words we will clothe ourselves. And when the time comes that God decides, our bodies will suddenly become incorrupt because of the words that we right now are proclaiming. Thanksgiving for the promise that is placed by God upon our account in Christ Jesus that we have concealed within our heart so that we can fulfill the will of God that contains our calling is a form of such praise where we obey our faith to the faith of God. We count ourselves dead to sin and living for God. We proclaim the not existent stronghold of incorruption in our body as existent. And so to praise God for what we have not is not yet in the uh, visible world faith is always looking at the things that are not yet visible it's looking for the fu to the future it it doesn't look at what's already happened and so when people say I will tell you what God has done had done I'll tell you what God did with me back in these days and I I say no tell me 
what God is planning to do with you. Tell me the future. Tell me what God has revealed to you. What is your future? Because we can live only with the future. We can't live even with the present. And of course, not with the past, however good it may be. We can live with the future. Faith is for the future, what has been promised to us, but has not yet been completed in the physical realm. It is specifically by the presence of a thankful heart that with thanksgiving opens up its desire and prayer to fulfill the will of God is how we determine that we have in ourselves the existence of the fruit of, of gentleness. Upon practice to bring an offering of praise to God means count yourself dead to sin and living for God, proclaim the not existent inheritance of Christ as existent. <coughs> that is ready to be revealed for us. It is concealed in heaven, Apostle Peter writes, and in the last days it is ready to be opened up. How? By faith it needs to be opened up. And so this inheritance needs to not only be in heaven, but in my heart also, <clears throat> because what is in heaven needs to be in the heart, because the kingdom of heaven is in three places. It is in the heights of the heavens, it is in the temple, in the church of saints that of course correspond to the good wife and is in the body of a person that trembles before God's words the preached word of God and that is a partaker of this good wife in these three connected with one another vessels there is the kingdom of God and when it is ready to be revealed in the last days by faith by faith for those kept for salvation <clears throat> and so, because the fire of God's favor can come down upon us when we are presenting our body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God in our praise, which provides God with the foundation He needs to show and confirm His salvation for us. And so, of course, the promise at the foundation of which is the adoption of our body. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Psalm 50, 23. When it comes to God, showing his salvation means become a guarantee for man for the fulfillment of his calling from the attempts and pursuing these people enemies in the given promise God has taken responsibility to make our salvation a reality if we honor him with an offering of praise and will be prudent in our ways that our ways be in accordance to the demands of God or the ways of righteousness and so that an offering of praise would honor God it is necessary that it be in accordance to the demands of an acceptable to God offering where a person can present God evidence to the right to bring him this offering of praise, where he spe specifies God's will for which he thanks him for. <clears throat> you don't thank God for everything, and Lord, I thank you for everything. Never pray, uh, say, Lord, I thank you for everything. Always <clears throat> specify what you thank him for, specific promises you're thanking him for. Say, Lord, thank you that you are my God and I am your child, I am your, your son, your daughter. Thank you that you are my Savior, you are my salvation. Thank you for the stronghold of incorruption in my body. Thank you for my children, for the salvation of my children. Thank God for the salvation of your children because God is judging your children not how they regard the truth or where they are currently, but how you regard the truth. If you regard the truth and you grow the seed of salvation into the fruits of salvation, then there is a guarantee that your house will also be saved with you. God has enough power to put them in such a position, open to them in such a way that they will bow before Him. I know when God reveals Himself to man, a person completely changes his priorities and desires, and what was very important and valuable to him becomes nothing. Apostle Paul says, what was what was gained to me I consider as nothing now, just so that I know my Lord Jesus Christ. 
in the given promise God promises to become or make our salvation happen. And so too, for us to understand how this happens, that there, it happens sometimes also that and it happens that so a so-called offering of praise instead of honoring God in this way, activate, activating God's mercy and His favor, a person instead is demonstrating disobedience to God and His word. He takes God's words that are in Scripture <clears throat> and says, Lord, I confess your words. May it be fulfilled for me. And he draws God's favor or God's uh, wrath upon him because he, it angers God when you say, here, this is your word, you wrote it in your Bible. God says, I am vigilant in the temple of my body over my words, not in the over the Bible, but here in the heart. Because you have met magnified your word in your temple above all your name in your temple and your temple is you you all of us together we are his temple the temple of the holy spirit if we are of course if we have built our body when a person is born from god he is not yet a temple of the holy spirit to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, you need to come out of spiritual infancy. To be a temple of the Holy Spirit is to be led by the Holy Spirit and to place yourself in dependence of the Holy Spirit. And how can you be led by the Holy Spirit if you're carnal and if you resist all that is spiritual and consider it foolishness? How can infants in Christ be led by the Holy Spirit if they are stumbling and, and attracted by various winds of doctrine that many different people are preaching and they call themselves delegates of God when they actually are not delegates of God. They weren't sent by anyone. Uh, they place themselves, a spirit of deception sometimes sends them, or a dream, a prophecy. And sometimes he's just elected by the form of a vote. But this is not the way. Let us read. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Why does God turn to these people and say, uh, these are people who bring their offerings, their tithes? Uh, he says, incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings. They're doing this for God, but he says, I can't stand uh, looking at this. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are trouble to me. Why? Because these were not God's feasts. These were these became their feasts. They were supposed to be the Lord's feasts and God's Sabbaths, uh, but it became their feasts, their Sabbaths. This, this was for their bodies, and they were supposed to celebrate it as the celebration of the Lord, as the Sabbath of the Lord. And so uh, they are a trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What does that mean? Uh, a murderer who hates his brother is a murderer. You hate each other is what he's saying. Your hands are full of, bl of blood. You hate each other. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Forgive one another and become considerate of one, of one another. Wash your hands of this blood. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 1, 12 through 20. And so today, many Christians consider praise uh, something that really isn't. People, first, they they almost behave demonically. Uh, they, they have rock and hip-hop as so-called praise, and they put out their fingers as horns, and, and then they decide, we're going to praise now, and they start waving their hands and they call it as a uh, worship 
Practically in scripture, songs of praise are not separate from songs of worship. Where there's praise but no worship, it can't be praise. And where worship is without praise, it can't be worship. And so for them, they have these all separated into different songs and where their worship, they don't have holiness. That is bringing yourself a living as a living sacrifice. And according to the book of Isaiah, this, these are not received by God. And so not to offend God with your praise, we need to remember by what criteria is the essence and status of legitimate praise determined in Scripture that the Scriptures call beautiful praise that is called to be a sign of brotherly love. And a sign of brotherly, this is a sign of brotherly love. We need to determine with our beautiful praise that we have brotherly love. And this praise is a sign of our gentleness and our gentle mouth. Because praise is what we have, that we have disciplined our mouth by the word of God. We confess the word of God that is not damaged. That is the gentleness of our mouth. What purpose is beautiful praise called to fulfill in our worshiping God by the sign of which we can judge that we are demonstrating the power of brotherly love in our faiths. Uh, third, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that our praise would obtain the status of legitimacy by the sign of which we can judge that we are demonstrating the power of brotherly love in our faith? And by what results do we judge that praise that we are bringing to God possesses the status of legitimacy by which we need to judge that we have the component of brotherly love in our faith. Therefore, to understand the essence of legitimate praise and in these four questions, we need to remember and answer uh, these questions. What is it? What is uh, beautiful praise? Who are we to praise? Who is worthy of praise? Who do we need to bring this praise to? Who are we to boast about? And who has the right to praise? Not all have the right to praise. Uh, to praise, you need to know the teaching, to be saturated with the teaching, to be uh, uh, knowledgeable and praise according to the words of Scripture. First question, by what criteria is the essence and status of legitimate praise determined in Scripture? Or what praise do the Scriptures call beautiful praise by the sign of which we need to judge of the presence of the atmosphere of brotherly love in our faith? First, the legitimacy of beautiful praise to God enthroned in the praises of Israel is identified as an inherited right that belongs exclusively to the line of the sons of Aaron, which consists in demonstrating the perfection of God who called us from darkness into his marvelous light by the sign of which we need to judge that we have the atmosphere of brotherly love in our faith. The nation was not able to praise God, the nation of Israel. You know that the Levites were taught and could do this. They taught the law. They were they learned the law from their youth, and when they turned twelve, every little boy and li every little girl already knew the five books by memory. You say they didn't understand? No, they did understand because they studied and the parents ex talked about the meaning of all of the five books. Of course, they didn't understand everything. Moses says, you will not be able to ever understand fully all of it, but to remember the five, the words of the five books, what the things we do understand, it, they belong to us and our children, but the things that are concealed, he said, is to the Lord God, and the concealed are these breads upon the table of, of showbreads that we bring into our temple that we've built upon the golden table of showbreads and it's God's food. What is opened for, to us is our food and for our children and what is concealed is food for God. God always hungers such for such food and such water. When we don't understand, but we accept, and why do we accept? Because the person whom says this words, who says these words, we are confident that it is God who sent him, and that God, it is God who said it, who was given this revelation, and He speaks this revelation. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praises beautiful. Psalm one forty-seven one. 
David was talking to the sons of Aaron, the Levites, because he was the composer and he was he was the choir director, and so he directed uh, the choirs, and there were others also who directed the choirs. The Levites sung, and David often, he, he would put on the temple's garments, and he also put on the, div, uh, the, uh, the garments of the high priest, because Jesus as the high priest came by the order of Melchizedek, but he came from the line of David. I am the uh, a root and offspring of David, and as he's the root and offspring of David, he came from by the order of Melchizedek. And so David, being from the line of Judah, he was a high priest also by the order of Melchizedek. And everyone knew this. He was able to enter into the holy place and he says, as I saw you in the holy place, he, he talked to, to God about this. And the priests never were against him doing this. They acknowledged the title, status of a high priest uh, in David. Upon what grounds that God revealed to them, he revealed to the priests that in this Jewish king, there is also a high priest but not by the order of Levi, but the, by the order of Melchizedek. By, and because of him, then will come Christ. And so this place of scripture indicates the fact that a beautiful praise is the power of warrior of a warrior in prayer to, and the right to be a king, priest, and prophet to God. And this is possible when a person, by being instructed in faith, grows into full measure of growth in Christ. And this happens when his justification that he receives as a format of guarantee will be turned to profit in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so that in the resurrection of Christ he can receive it as a fruit of righteousness as his own. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Psalm 33, 1. From, from the upright praise from the upright is beautiful and so from the upright anybody else who praises it won't be beautiful and so when it comes to praise it, it is for God and regarding his word and regarding his deeds because you could praise your 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 son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, or whomever else. But when we're talking, when the Word of God talks about praise, then it is referring to, of course, only praising God and praising His works. In Hebrew, this means to honor, to glorify, enthrone Him in praise, magnify, thank, be thankful, shine, to emit light, to illuminate. And so, this is the word that's in your heart. When it is talking about specific praise, where God is magnified and the power to the right to praise Him, then the word praise in Hebrew means present evidence for the right to bring Him this praise. List the names and titles of God. As David does this, as we on Fridays, we together proclaim God's names, that He's our strength, that He's our stronghold, that He is our deliverer. Lord, You are my refuge. Lord, You are my rock, and so forth. And so, what we, we do, we list the names and titles of God, and this is a form of praise. Study God's name, study His titles, and praise Him with uh, with these names, what He's done for you, who He is for you, who you are to Him, and this will be a beautiful praise, because you will be bringing this from your heart. First, put it into your heart, and then proclaim it with your mouth. List the perfect works of God. Thank God for the work that He has already done in your life and the life of his nation, beginning with Adam, boast about God and trust upon God. Trust God and not abandon your place in the body of Christ. Be faithful to your calling, which is the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ, and to study and fulfill the desires of God. Not what I want, but what He wants. 
And so the thought that is contained in praise here is the demonstration of the fundamental discipline of the spirit, which has many angles, many sides, and many functions in the format of the continual praise of God. And so therefore, by him, by Christ, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Hebrews 13, 15. Here it's talking about the hierarchy, first of all. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God by Him. We can't directly praise God. We can't just turn to Christ and the Holy Spirit. In other words, that's forbidden. This is a violation of the hierarchy because we need to turn to God directly, not uh, not the Son or the, or, the, or the Holy Spirit, but we turn to God directly through Jesus Christ. And when we do through Jesus Christ and we bear the fruit of our lips, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom and by whom I am able to praise you for what you did with my soul. You delivered me from the enemies of darkness. You destroyed the stronghold of death in my body. You erected the stronghold of life in my body. And when this kind of praise is spoken, and when you begin to pray this way, then this immediately clothes you into the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit immediately comes to such a prayer and close it with his power and brings it to God and then brings the response back to you from God. When it is referring to the continuous offering of praise to God being brought in the form of a sacrifice, then this means that praise can be brought by a specific person upon a specific place and in a specific order in a, or in accordance to a specific statute. In other words, it is brought to a priest upon the territory of the temple and in accordance to the statutes of how an offering is to be brought. Therefore, the questions who is to be praised, not rhetorical, although we all have the same answer, God is to be praised. However, people often praise God, but at the same time, they are pushing themselves out in some way. What is a choir when there's a group of people and they sing in such a way that not one be separate from another, the voices not be... uh, And when there's only one voice trying to push itself out from the others, they want to show that they have a better or more powerful voice than someone else. They they do not fit into a choir setting. A choir, uh, each sings in a way so you hear the other. Then there's a balance of voices, a harmony. As soon as someone tries to push themselves out, there's a, a break in this harmony so that we understand the kind of praise we bring to God. It is a harmonious praise when the powerful or stronger one does not uh, stand over the weaker one, but, but rather helps the weaker one, brings them up. So who do we perceive God to be? Who do we call God to whom we pray? To whom is our praise to, uh, to be brought? Who do we bring our praise to? And how is our praise supposed to be? Not many know. If all of us had one understanding of God, then today we would not have dreamy jungles of all kinds of religious sects and confessions that exclude one the other and fight with one another. And our service to God in our house of prayer and temples would not be different from one the other, and God would not have any need or reason to say that our incense to Him is an abomination, and that He cannot bear them, and that He hates the pompousness of celebrations that are in our churches. According to Scripture, we all believe in one God that the nation of Israel believed in, that uh, the one that is written about upon the pages of Scripture and in three individuals, But God the Father is the head of the three. In Scripture, the word unified and as one means an organic wholesomeness of sovereign beings pursuing one goal where each has their own individual face, their own individual function or role, as well as their own individual purpose or calling. 
there is a thought, the word, and action. If you pay attention, three functions, thought, word, and action. These three specific (coughs) forms of work uh, are a whole and are individual. And although there are three different functions, they completely uh, correspond to that identification of one as one (coughs) or unified. The word comes from the thought, and the act comes from the word. And so in these three identifications, in three functions, we see the function of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The role of the Father is the function of the thought. The role of the Son is the function of the word that resounds this thought into the universe, reveals it, opens up that thought, uh, makes it known as the role of the Holy Spirit is the act that fulfills then that word. And God said, let there be light, and the Holy Spirit created that light. And so from uh, looking at these functions in prayer, we need to turn to the main face, that is to the Father himself, who presents and from whom proceed the other two, the Son and Holy Spirit, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 13, 15, 13 14. In this short phrase, he spe- states, he says it twice, that we don't ask anything directly from him, but ask f- from the Father in his name. The Son and the Holy Spirit are uh, intercessors. They're the middlemen. Uh, of the words that God speaks. And so although the Holy Spirit, He intercesses before God for us and with us, the intercession of the Son, uh, of course, is the, is, str- is the one preferred or the one before. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And so when I hear, when people pray, and they pray, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, and our God. That's how one unclean or wicked person liked to pray that left this service. I always was uh, thinking, does he not know how I pray, or how does he not hear me praying? And he was trying to boast in this way. He didn't want to imitate me. He wanted his own and presented the... Uh, Lie. Jesus said, he said to his Jews, to his disciples that needed to pass it on, that they are to pray to the Father, turn to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. He taught, and then he said, this is an example of prayer, but you need to pray this prayer in my name. I once said that there's an example. A person comes and he comes to the table to apply for a passport, and it says on the form how to fill, fill, uh, complete the form. And you put in your name uh, when you're born, Uh, date you were born, where you were born, location. And so a young person comes, he's 18 years old, and he has a very different name, and he writes, and he copies everything that the other one wrote. And he says, "What what did you give me? He copied everything from the example that was shown how to fill out the form. There was an example with a name, a date, everything. So this person copied everything over to the new form and gave it to him. And he says, and he says, why did you copy all this over? You're supposed to give your own information. And so again, uh, we see here this prayer that Jesus gave is an example. But we need to pray in the name of Jesus Christ and pray from our from ourselves um, when we pray it. 
Considering that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the middleman between us and the Heavenly Father, and the Holy Spirit give, is the power that makes our intercession legitimate, we need to always turn to our Heavenly Father, as God as our Heavenly Father. We turn to God as our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit, your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you, John 15, 16. Violating the, this legitimate, legitimate principle discredits our right to prayer and prompts the wrath of God against the one uh, praying. I have many times seen similar forms of religious bacchanalia where leaders of charismatic churches called the nation to blow kisses to Jesus as a demonstration of their love to Jesus. Understandably, not all religious leaders share in this kind of sacrilege, sending Jesus blown kisses, and many of them do, but many of them do regardless of their exclusive position, either turn to Jesus directly and doing so ignore the leadership of the Heavenly Father or turn to Him by the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or Mary, the mother of Jesus, or names of other people that they have made saints or, uh, or ones they claim have pleased God. Therefore, in essence, these people are no different from one another, although they title themselves under particular confessions and exclude all other confessions. The thing is, in Scripture, the word praise is a specific legitimate instrument and a legitimate format that confirms our legitimate relationship with God. And so, by the means of praise, the children of God are to confirm their legitimate relationship with God as their Heavenly Father and build their relationship with Him, receiving help from Him when needed. And so, having a legitimate praise for God, you need to examine yourself in this way, whether you have brotherly love and that you are passed from the state of death into a state of eternal life. Right now we will pray and all those who want to resist any kind of form of uh, foolishness maybe that we've been doing because of ignorance or that those that may be bound by sin, lust, passions, uh, you can uh, become free of these things if you feel bad that you sinned. God has enough power to show His mercy, and He wants to show His mercy. The righteous will fall seven times, but rise again. The very desire to repent already says that God is for you. We wait for you here at the altar.
I will be praying your prayer. And I ask you to deeply believe that God is on your side. He is not against you. He sees your heart, your pain, the wounds because of ignorance, because of sin, because of many different things. He doesn't just desire, he can right now break these chains of sin and pour into your heart peace. He can heal with his balm of healing your wounds, your souls, your eyes are closed. This is your secret room. Lift your hands to God. This is a sign that your hands are without wrath or doubt, that you have forgiven those who have offended you, and that you're ready to ask forgiveness those maybe that you've offended. Pray together with me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I open my heart. You see my pain that is inflicted by sin. I hate sin. I hate it. And I ask you, help me break these chains. Heal me. Cleanse me. By the blood of your Son, I accept your forgiveness, your freedom, your justification and right now before heaven and hell I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words I am washed I am cleansed I am healed I am restored I am justified and I am saved your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ may the Lord bless you May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May upon you the blessings of the ancient mountains and everlasting hills be on you. May this be fulfilled on you and your children, and the nation shall say, Amen. Blessed is God who is vigilant in the temple of our body over His word that we have put into our heart. He fulfills all that He says and He fulfills it independent of what we may feel. One may feel it, one may not feel it, but feelings are not the way to determine something. We know that God's words is His information, and if God said that He forgave you and He cleaned you and that He justified you, then regardless of what you're feeling, you need to accept that and begin thanking God that you are justified. And so now let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.